in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is the founder of Crucible Leadership, Warwick Fairfax Warwick. Thanks for being with us today. Great to be here, Kevin. I'm excited to have you on. You've got a pretty incredible story. You know, I've interviewed a few guests that talk about failure, but I think your story is a little unique. Would you mind sharing with the good folk out there listening to this how this story goes? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Kevin. And again, thanks for having me on. Um, so basically, uh, I grew up in Australia. Uh, listeners may kind of wondering where that accent is. Is it English? Is it African? You know, where is it? Well, it's Australian. Um, so I grew up in this 150-year-old family media business. Um, but the time I was growing up, it was very large. It had uh, TV stations, radio, magazines, newspapers. It had the equivalent of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Washington Post of our country. So really the opinion leaders. Um, and so uh, I was the fifth generation, and I was expected by my parents to take a leading position and you know, would have inherited, uh, I guess, uh, you know, significant shareholding in the company. But as often happened in family businesses, there was instability, there was friction going back decades. Some other family members threw my dad out as chairman in 1976. So come early 87, um, my dad died. He was in his late 80s. I'd just come back from Harvard Business School. I did my undergrad at Oxford in England, worked on Wall Street, Harvard Business School, all to prepare myself to take a leading position. But after my dad died, uh, stock price at the company started rocketing up. The market felt it was in play, as they say. And being young and idealistic, I felt like I was 26 at the time. I felt like something needed to be done. I felt like the company wasn't being managed very well or run along the ideals of the founder. So in uh, late August 87, I launched a $2.25 billion takeover, straight in dollars, but still a lot of money. It's probably, I don't know what, $1.5 billion or more US, somewhere around there at the time. Uh, and so really from the beginning, uh, things went wrong. Uh, the family members sold out. 87 stock market crash hurt our uh, asset sale program. So by the end of the year, we had an unsustainable level of debt. I brought in new management that increased operating profits 80%, which I suppose you could say validated my premise that the company wasn't being as well managed. But the interest in debt was so much, it really didn't matter what management was doing at operating level. Fast forward three years, we get to late 1990, Australia gets to the big recession. Newspapers are very cyclical in terms of revenue, and the company had to file for bankruptcy. Hmm. So my whole goal had been to preserve the family company, to see it be well managed, be run along the ideals of the founder. So uh, in some sense, what I did directly contributed to the opposite of what I wanted to achieve. It fell out of family control. Companies still went on, but not within family control. I moved to the U.S. in uh, you know late 1990. My wife's American. I've been here ever since. So that's probably a short synopsis of the story, if you will. And Warwick, you said the objective was to take over the family company, to, to run it, to grow it. What was the objective of the actual company, though? Like, why, What was the intention of why this company started? Yeah, good question. Uh, it was started by my great-great-grandfather, John Fairfax, who um, you know, came out from England, and he really wanted to start an independent newspaper. He never, in, you know, back in the 1800s, most newspapers were party papers. Like in U.S., you know, people, you know, it was either a Democratic paper or a Republican paper, like you had the New York Times and, the, you know, New York Tribune, one was Democrat, one was Republican, like in the times of Lincoln. That's kind of what you did in the 1800s. You know, people didn't say, oh, we're independent. Well, no, you didn't do that. But that wasn't, John Fairfax's vision was that, in fact, the masthead of the paper uh, when he bought it was, may Whigs call me Tory and Tory call me Whig, which is basically may liberals call me conservative, conservative call me liberal. So that was always the ethos, um, if you will. Mm. So yeah, it was, the vision was to have be a, a force for good and the young country of Australia and um, 
Yeah, very idealistic. And uh, it was a strong vision. The founder, John Fairfax, not only did he grow his business, he treated his employees very well. He was an elder at his church, wonderful husband, dad. Everything in life was balanced. In terms of a role model for leadership, every every box was checked. Right. You know, and yet he had a successful business and he had an impact and he founded all sorts of nonprofit organizations on the side. Mm. So in terms of a real leader, to me, it's that's like the benchmark, at least for, for, to me, what a real leader should be. Well, it seems like there's definitely some big shoes to fill, like help our audience understand, you know, what it's like growing up in a fifth generation, large media conglomerate like that. What are some of the expectations and maybe some of the pressure that you had to face growing up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, um, you know, sometimes parents might ask their kids, so what do you want to do in life? And, you know, and you don't always know when you're really small as a kind of fireman, policeman, I don't know, quite whatever. Um, but for me, that was an irrelevant question. It's almost, you know, like I'm, we're big fans of the crown and the whole royal family thing, which is obviously in the news. And in some strange way, it felt a bit like that. Like, mm. do you think Prince William is thinking, gee, I wonder what I should do in life? Right. No. You know, I mean, it would be, he will be derelict in his duty to the nation of Britain or indeed, you know, the Commonwealth or beyond. And it did feel like that, that, uh, that I had no choice and I would have devastated certainly my father and parents and betrayed my ancestors. So yeah, the, the pressure to fulfill a role that frankly, I didn't feel like I was designed for. I'm more of a reserved, you know, advisor, executive coach type, which is part of what I do. You know, the whole take no, you know, prisoners, uh, Rupert Murdoch type of executive. That's just not me. And so I've so, but I never felt like I had a choice. So the whole Oxford, Wall Street, Harvard Business School, it wasn't so much I had a passion for financial business. It's just, well, that's not relevant. It's what skills do I need? I'm going to prepare myself. What's the job? Let me equip myself. So, and I guess the other aspect to your question is, because it's so prominent, you know, we not only were we wealthy, but we were very established and very well respected by the community. It wasn't mm -hmm. like oh, some wealthy people that just rip people off. It was money, respect, status. You know, I suppose for people in that realm, it's everything you want, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you put a foot wrong, I mean, can you imagine? You know, Warwick kind of. Uh, drinks as a teenager and has a DUI or something. I mean, oh my gosh, fortunately that never happened, but right. it'll be on the new, in the newspapers. For most of us, we make our silly mistakes when we're young. Who knows? For me, if I made a mistake, everybody would know. So mm -hmm. the pressure to be very, very careful was huge. I mean, I was very aware of, you know, I don't want to put a foot wrong. I want to, don't want to disappoint my parents. So yeah, it was a lot of pressure. And so when you came back from Harvard and took this company over, Looking back now, would you have done anything differently? And what was some of the turmoil that you were dealing with internally with your family? Yeah, I mean, a lot of things I would do differently. Some of the things, obviously, in hindsight, but whether it was right or wrong, other family members showing my father out as chairman 11 years beforehand, I mean, I just felt like he wasn't perfect. He was a great man who I dearly loved. I just I couldn't understand how you could do that. You know, he was you know, probably in his 70s at the time, but very healthy, very mentally acute. So that was a subtext, um, a bit too much idealism, thinking, oh, things need to be changed. And one could debate if they, if it was bad, as, as bad as I thought it was, at least in terms of the ideals of the company. How it was run, yeah, I think objectively, I think they made some decisions that weren't optimal. But you know, just being, I mean, there's a lot of lessons. Sometimes we're so certain our truth is the objective truth, right? Mm -hmm. We hear everything from our side, whether it's in politics or business, you feel like, oh, I know the truth, right? Right. All my buddies, all my associates tell me we all agree we're in a little echo chamber. And so I felt I was certain other family members weren't running uh, the company as well as it should have been and management wasn't. But did I talk to them? Did I say, here's what I'm thinking? I mean, I was very young, just out of Harvard Business School. It would have been a big ask at 26 to expect that level of emotional maturity, at least where I grew up. 
So yeah, I could have paused, tried to listen, learn before going in with all guns blazing. You know, as soon as I got off the plane, it felt like not quite, but close, you know, from the US after business school. Mm. So, you know, just don't assume that that what you believe is truth is truth. Don't believe you have all the information. Talk to the other side, whatever that means to you. Gather facts, gather information. Be a little slower to jump in when throw the hand grenades. I mean, mm. it's it's so tempting. You know, we all get a little self righteous. I'm fighting for truth, honor, and the American way, as I think they used to say in the Superman show way back when. You know that whole kind of thing. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and just assuming that the, the family would would sell wouldn't sell to me and we trapped in a privatized company was an incredibly stupid assumption. But when you've got all these emotions swimming around you, you, you make you can make some really, I mean, how could a Harvard Business School Oxford graduate make so many dumb decisions? I mean, it's still puzzling to me, to be honest, as I look at it. But yeah, I made a stack of really cataclysmic dumb decisions that had huge effects on me and other people. Well, it makes sense to me because when, you know, myself and others coming out of college, we think we should be the CEO right away. You know, right. we don't realize the experience and, and everything that goes into running an organization and what comes along with uh, that responsibility at that time. When you're 26 years old, you take over the organization and then a couple, of, I want to stay on this timeline, a couple of years later, you move to Annapolis, Maryland, when we think about crucible moments, explain to our audience what you mean by crucible leadership and what was your crucible moment? Yeah, I mean, crucible leadership is really um, at the center of it is how do you overcome crucible moments? And crucible moments or crucible experiences, those are ones in which you maybe have failed on a spectacular scale or you may have a setback. It could be emotional, financial, or physical uh, we have a podcast ourselves, Beyond the Crucible, and we've interviewed people from all kinds of backgrounds, races, gender, everything from a Navy SEAL who was paralyzed in a training accident to people that have suffered abuse growing up to financial failure, you name it. So whatever your f- setback or failure, the question is, how do you recover from that and mm-hmm. you know achieve a vision that you believe is matters or make a difference in the world? How do you bounce back from that and not hide under the covers for the next 30, 40, 50 years until it all ends. That's really at the heart of crucible leadership. And so, you know, we have a choice when we're faced with those devastating moments to say, okay, you can either be angry at yourself, which I certainly could have been and have been, or angry at others. How could they do this to me? Or both. And anger typically doesn't serve us or anybody else. But how do you recover from that? So, that's the overall question. I guess your other question is, well, how did I recover from that, right? Uh, and most of the 90s were not easy because I'm a reflective person. And you, as people do, you play this tape over and over again. How could I have been so dumb? How could I have been so dumb? What could I have done differently? What would have happened if I talked to other family members? Maybe they would have listened. Maybe they wouldn't have. What if I used different advisors? You know, maybe they would have had a better plan. I don't know. What if I'd been more patient? What if I gave more interviews, which I never did? What if I actually talked to the employees and journalists, which I didn't because I was a bit shy and retiring? And, you know, I mean, all these what ifs. The sad thing about what ifs is you never get to play them out. It's unknowable. Could it have worked? Maybe, but you don't know. And so that's part of the challenge. And the other challenge I faced was, um, I felt like I'd let my family down uh, and in some strange way, because I'm a person of faith, like the founder, John Fairfax, in my naivety and stupidity again, I felt like, oh, God must have a plan to resurrect the company and the ideals of the founder. Not so much from a direct faith perspective, but more how people are treated. And, oh, I let God down. Well, again, if, if, if God or whoever you believe in wanted it to happen, fate, whatever, providence, it would have happened. So that was crushing. So yeah, it was, and then I had to figure out, well, now what do I do in life? You know, what do I do? You know, I was like close to 30 at that point. What do I do now for the next X amount of decades? 
um, how can I find anything that will contribute to society as much as what I could have been in Australia, right? Everything else is playing small balls, small potatoes, right? Hmm. So it'd be easy to say, well, gee, I missed my chance to have a big impact in the world. One and done. Hmm. Never. So, yeah, it was pretty crushing on, you know, emotional, spiritual, self-worth, self-esteem, you name it. It was all pretty rock bottom. So, yeah, it was, it, it was devastating, certainly. And I just think, you know, sometimes there's all like there comes a person or a name that just it's one word that really works and, and summarizes everything that goes on. And crucible to me really is that. And I was looking at your website, you know, severe trials that leads to the creation of something new. Thinking about metals forming together, severe trials, elements interacting, reacting and you know, stress, all the things that you just summarize and it leads to something new. So when we talk about failure, let's talk about failure. Let's talk about the severity of failure. Tell me a little bit more about the emotional reactions that led you to become someone new. I think it's really, there's so many aphorisms that seem very trite, like use your pain for a purpose. We must have heard that a hundred times, but Sometimes amidst those oft used phrases, there's some wisdom. And so, you know, how can I use what I've been through to help others? And, you know, I really didn't know. And sometimes as you're searching for answers and, you know, as I'm clawing my way back, I work for a local aviation services firm in Annapolis, Maryland, where I live doing financial analysis and then business. Cause I, I knew I was pretty analytical. I'd work on wall street back in the day. I actually was pretty decent on Excel and, you know, baby steps, then got into executive coaching. Uh, yeah, I went to a, a woman that does mid-career assessment. She said, boy, you, you you listen, you ask questions, you'd have a good profile for that. Of course, I'd never heard of executive coaching. But really, probably the most pivotal moment in which I could see that there was a purpose to the pain. Um, it's easy to say that, but what does that mean in a specific circumstance? So in 2008, you know, we go to a non-denominational church in Annapolis and my pastor was giving a message on life of David, you know, righteous person, falsely persecuted. He was a good guy. And his boss, Saul, was jealous and wanted to kill him. I was just sort of the, usually that doesn't happen these days if your boss gets jealous, but it did back in the day. And I said, well, like, I'm not David. I brought a lot of my own fault, you know, problems on myself. But fine, I'm not Mr. Charismatic Speaker, but I can give a seven-minute talk if that's what would be helpful. And what was amazing to me is after that, people came up to me for weeks and months and said, Warwick, that was so helpful. And I'm thinking, hmm. okay, who in the congregation can relate to my story? How many people have done $2 billion take and grew up in 150-year-old family businesses? Like nobody, you know? I mean, it's one thing to say you've had a physical injury, you're a cancer survivor. Those are horrendous, but sadly, a lot of people have been through that. They, they get it, you know? Who could get my story if it's somehow the universality of uh, failure, of loss of self-esteem, of letting people down? Somehow it helped people. So I thought, okay, and that's where I began to write my book, uh, which will come out later this year. That's where crucible leadership was born it's like if i can talk about what i went through and some of the lessons i've learned and, and that it helps people then it's worth it so that that's really was the birth of the vision of crucible leadership that one talk so i guess the short story is who knows what moment you will face mm. that could be the opening of that next chapter i mean if you're open to it it could come from anywhere and you know change the direction of your life and do you think the same principles apply to people at a later stage in their career? For instance, you're 26 years old. You got your right. whole life ahead of you. Let's right. say 50, 52-ish midlife sure. crisis yeah. going on. Do the principles still apply? They do. I think, you know, typically, certainly for business executives, they're usually not reflective they're kind of action men, action women. They just make a hundred decisions a day. Don't have time to think. You just got to move, got to decide. The world's going quick. If you don't decide, you get left behind. So let's just, you know, move first, think later kind of thing is your typical executive. And so when crucibles happen, and sadly, even if you haven't had one, you probably will because life is not like Disneyland. Life is tough. I, don't, I hardly know anybody 
Pitts had a charmed life with no family tragedy, no business tragedy, tragedy, no setbacks, not getting passed over for promotion. I mean, it, I've never met a person like that. So we all will go through crucibles. And so when you go through them, you know, what happens is you get hit like by a truck and then you, you can't help but reflect, how did this happen? This hurts. I'm in excruciating pain physically, emotionally. So what do I do now? And that's where reflection can be helpful because you have a unique opportunity to say, well, I could keep doing what I'm doing, but what do I want my life to be like? How do mm -hmm. I want to be remembered? Again, the oft used phrase, and somebody's giving you the eulogy about you on your funeral. Well, what do you want them to say about you? You made millions or billions of dollars. Maybe you made a contribution in life. Maybe you made the world more sustainable. Your mm -hmm. kids, your, your friends were proud of you. What is it you want your legacy? And mm. very few people will say, even business executives, I have hardly met any of well, very few that will say, you know, it's all about, you know, earnings per share and how much money I make and how much I'm in the bank account. That's all, that's all I care about. I haven't met too many of those folks, mm. you know? Um, and so when you get hit with the crucible experience, think about what do I, we call, talk about a life of significance which basically means a life on purpose dedicated to happiness. Our premise is when you're other focused, you will be happier and more joyful. And it's our premise that that's because that's how humans are designed. You may like how humans are designed or not, but it's the way it works. It's the way we're designed. We're designed to really be other focused in terms of if we want really joy and fulfillment. And that could mean very many different things to different people. But think about in those, so if you're 52, it's like, okay, I, maybe I don't have to go quit and start a nonprofit, but maybe I can think of my company in a different way. Maybe I can, you know, give back, you know, uh, help my employees achieve their dreams. Maybe we can set up our own nonprofit within the organization to do what we think, you know, we can as a company to, to help uh, those around us. So even if you're CEO of a company, you can begin to think differently. You don't necessarily have to quit, you know, but what do I want my legacy to be? You know, what do I want the legacy of this company to be? Th Those are the issues you should be focusing on more than just earnings per share. So when you're working with these CEOs, are you asking them specifically about their own life or about how they could change their life that could impact their organization? Well, I think certainly through, you know, podcast and writing and what have you, um, I think it's, I think it's both. I mean, you start from the inner before you get to the outer. It's, you know, what do you want your life to be like? And we always start with um, how are you designed? We're all designed and wired a certain way. You may be artistic, mathematical, um, introverted, extroverted. And typically those are things you can't do a whole lot about. You may like it or not like it. You know, if you're not athletic, yes, you could want to try to be a Wimbledon champion, but, you know, why do that? You know, focus on the areas where you're good at. So it starts with your design. And then it's like, well, what is it you're really passionate about? What what gets you up in the morning? Um, how does that tie to your fundamental beliefs? It could be faith. It could be uh, spiritual. It could be a set of values or philosophies. What do you believe is really important in life? And so when you intersect how you're wired with your fundamental beliefs, whatever that means to you, in an area where you feel like matters, that's where a compelling vision is birth. That's where a vision that will get through most roadblocks. So it's really design what you're passionate about, tied to your fundamental beliefs in a vision that you think matters and will mm -hmm. somehow make a difference. So those are sort of the, I guess, the different strings, if you will, that you want to tie together. Got it. And there's an interesting parallel that I think your story represents so well. And that is, if you've been watching any TV, you'll see <laughs> commercials that say, don't be your parents. <laughs> it's hard not to, right? And it's yeah. something that's in the Bible. It's something that's right. in, you said it's not Disneyland, but it's also in ma many Disney movies. And it makes right. sense and it hits and it connects with people such as, you know, Aladdin or the Lion King, right? How do I yeah. not be my father? And so when, when you think or, or, about- Or maybe Star Wars, right? Oh my Star gosh, Wars. Darth Vader's my father. <laughs> exactly, I couldn't have said it better myself. 
So when we start to identify what makes us unique, is that a way to kind of break away from the legacy of being the, the, the war, you know, the Fairfax uh, overtaker of the company and being the same person yeah. as legacy? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm not a believer in rebelling for the sake of rebelling, you know? Um, but it's, you know, uh, it's funny. My, I'm somewhat similar to my dad in the sense my dad was, was very philosophical. You know, he, he didn't have the same maybe evangelical faith that I do. He was more ecumenical, but he was philosophical. He would have been a good philosophy professor. He wasn't really a business guy. He wrote well, but he wasn't really living his own life. You know, we've had almost mm. a few generations of people living somebody else's vision, in this case, five generations before. And the founder's vision, it was a very noble vision. I mean, how can you argue with having an independent newspaper that uh, up, that uplifts the nation of Australia? It's not a bad vision. You know, I applaud it. It's just wasn't one I want to spend my whole life in, you know, controlling some big newspaper. I'm, I'd rather advise and ask questions and be the upfront leader. So part of it is, you know, you, you might have genes that are exactly like your mom or dad and you want to do what they do. And uh, uh, great. But hopefully these days, the wise parents aren't saying, son, daughter, you know, we've got generations of doctors and lawyers in our family. And so you get to choose what your specialty is, orthopedics, heart surgery, if you're a lawyer, tax, corporate, maybe nonprofit, or there's no money in that. So probably stick to corporate or tax. But, you know, uh, you know, there's something wrong with doing what your parents do, but you want to make sure that you're doing it because you want to do it. It's your life. You only get one shot at this. So loyalty is a good thing. Don't rebel just for the sake of it, but just, and if you have hopefully good parents, they will encourage you to be who you want to be. I've, tr I've got three kids in their 20s. I've tried to encourage them, look, I don't care what you do so long as you enjoy it and feel fulfilled. Mm. You know, I counsel them, I coach them, but I'm not pointing them in a direction I want them to do. I want them to be who they want to be. Mm, so. Right. And it's very difficult for uh, the successor to let their family members know they don't want to work for the company anymore. If your you know, father was still around, would you be able to have that conversation? And if you could have that conversation, what, what would you, how would you approach it? Yeah. I mean, if, you know, if I, I think back, if my father had been around, you know, for even another few years, um, it would have been impossible. I couldn't have done it. There's, there's no way in the world because I dearly loved him after what happened with him being thrown out as chairman, he looked at me as the next generation. I unfortunately worked hard at school. I got good grades. I didn't do stupid things, you know, wild parties or drugs or whatever. I was, quote unquote, the good son, whatever that means, in the sense of, you know, which just raised expectations. It made things so much worse. Mm. If I was some, you know, uh, typical uh, wealthy kid that was just, spoiled and dilettante and yeah it would have been easy to write me off but sadly i made it so much tougher so i couldn't have said to him dad i'm not going to the family business it would have dev it would have crushed him mm. there's no i would have felt like i was being disloyal i was betraying him i mean i would have felt about that was about as easy a conversation if forgive the analogy if prince william had said to his dad or his grandmother i'm not going to the family business can you imagine no yeah it would crush them you would crush them. You know, it's like, this isn't an option. It's your birthright. It's your duty to the nation. Mm -hmm. That's the conversation. I know it sounds a weird analogy, but it, it feels like that. So I guess if you're in a family business, frankly, the onus is on the parents. The onus is on the parents to sort of suck it up and say, look, I love this business. I founded it. You know, maybe my, you know, grandparents founded it, but look, don't feel like you have to do this. Son, daughter, I'm not kidding. I want you to be happy. The world will go on with that ex business being in the family. Mm. And you got to really mean it and encourage them. Uh, it's really up to the parents to do that. It, 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 the kids will either rebel or, like me, be overly loyal. But it's, it, the onus is on the parents from my perspective. Well, what's crazy for me is just us as humans setting expectations for ourselves and just putting a ton of pressure and playing mind games with ourselves to achieve who we think we want to be. 
how can business owners, entrepreneurs, leaders listening to this right now start to perceive expectations in a different way? I think um, quit trying to live up to your parents' dream. Quit trying to live up to who you think you should be, not who you want to be. We can put our own um, expectations on ourselves. I have to be responsible. Um, I have to go to business school. I would have loved to have my own little art gallery and I don't know, you're in California, I don't know, Sausalito, or you pick the idyllic spot. I may make no money, but I just love to paint nature or people's stories. I mean, it's like, but everybody's telling me that's irresponsible to be a painter. You know, if I can be a lawyer, because maybe I can write well, I should do that, right? Isn't that responsible? Well, life's about choices. If you're a painter, you probably won't be able to have this nice house or car or holiday home as you would a lawyer or, you know, businessman but or business person. But, you know, quit trying to live up to your own expectations or others. If you enjoy painting, again, I'm idealistic. I still am. Just paint. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you'll have to take a, you know, job in uh, high school or maybe uh, teach at a college. You won't make millions of dollars, but you'll have enough to live off of. But if that's what makes you happy, that's okay. It's, life's not all about money. So part of it is just quit living up to other people's expectations and including your own. And this sounds so simplistic. I want to say do what makes you happy, but do what makes you feel fulfilled that really is in line with your gifting and somehow even painting. I say even that can be a gift to other people and to the world. It can enlighten people and just like movies can. So many things can be looked at in a way that gives pleasure and joy and growth to other people. So does that make sense at all? It's just quit being feeling guilty for being who you truly feel you are. You know, exactly. And and back to significance, right? And, And so if we think about this illusion of success on a macro scale, it seems like you have thought about it. What change would you like to see? if people were to adopt that different perception of what expectations and significance is? I think, you know, we talk a lot about the difference between success and significance. I mean, I have no problem with success. I mean, I'm not as wealthy as I was, but, you know, we have enough money that a couple of years ago, uh, my daughter was in uh, Australia. I guess my kids are all dual citizens. And so we said, well, let's set up let's meet up in the middle between the U.S. and Australia. Well, we spent Christmas in Hawaii. Well, it's not exactly the cheapest time of year to go there. But because of family and it was a fun thing to do, we did. So I'm not against enjoying things in life. I'm not one of these people that says you have to, you know, sackcloth and ashes and oh, woe is me. And I think that's just silly. But you can enjoy things in life without letting money own you or control you. Or, you know, because how much is enough? millions, billions, you know? It's like the millionaire says, well, I have a nice house in the Hamptons, but I can't afford the house in the south of France. Mm. I have a little, I have a little private jet, but my buddy has a bigger Gulf Stream. I mean, you know, there's always somebody with bigger and better and more, right? right? And so if you measure it that way, you'll almost certainly lose. And so quit focusing on benchmarks of money as success, but more how do you define success? And, you know, in life's significance world, it's it's really more other focused. Well, what does it mean to you to give back? What does it mean to you to use your skills to uh, focus on others? You know, there's a lot of wealthy folks like, you know, Bill Gates. He has this massive Bill Gates Foundation. Well, clearly he's investing massive amounts of money, more than most of us can. Well, I don't know him. I don't really know his story super well beyond what you read. But it clearly seems to me that his life, and he, I think, retired from Microsoft at a relatively young age. He stopped being CEO. Well, why did he do that? Because there were things he wanted to do in the world of education and other things. So he's he's as successful as anybody, right? Mm -hmm. But he's certainly other-focused. So there are models out there in which you can be successful and also focused on other people. And so much of the uh, people and real leaders, right? The mm-hmm. people you talk to, that's what they do, whether it's clean water in Africa or they're focused on how can we make the world more sustainable and 
environmentally conscious. I mean, a lot of people in your world, are, they're more other focused, right? They're not just about money. Um, so it's, it's not su success or significance. It's not success or ph philanthropy. It's, it's possible to be both. Mm. It's not an either, it's not a zero sum game. Right. And I love that concept of there, there will always be something bigger. And right. I remember, um, you know, my grandpa telling me, he's, you know, he's a big fisherman, Warwick, and mm -hmm. he said, you know, this, he, he takes this little canoe out on the river and <laughs> fishes every day. And he said, you know, this boat's essentially the same thing as someone getting a yacht. He's like, I have the same amount of fulfillment from this little canoe that someone else would have from a yacht. Remember and, that. and and that's such a great it's funny you mentioned that because we just came out with a blog and podcast on what we called the whole well goat syndrome if you will greatest of all time and you know you have you know obviously uh you know tiger woods roger federer tom brady and you know the problem with trying to be the greatest of all time is it's hard to achieve that and maintain it you know i'm a big tennis fan and roger federer fan and he's on 20 grand slams while he's got uh, Rafa Nadal and Novak Djokovic nipping at his heels. Rafa Nadal, they call him the King of Clay, which come June in uh, the French Open, unless a miracle happens, if you're a Federer fan. Uh, Nadal's a wonderful person. He will beat Federer's record. Okay. Uh, Tiger Woods with his injury, sadly, it's going to be tough for him to catch um, Jack Nicholas. Yeah. So, you know... One of the things I love about Roger Federer, as far as I can tell, is he plays for the love of the game. And when he's asked about this, it's look, I want everybody to do their best and achieve everything they want to achieve. Mm. And you feel like he really believes this. You know, he just plays because he loves the game. So even if you're the best tennis player, businessman, businesswoman, do it for the love of the game. Again, that other aphorism. If you, tr if you try to do it because you want to be the best of all time, you're set up for failure because records are meant to be broken, right? Mm. So, you know, it's, uh, and then when you achieve the top, what happens? There's this big letdown because it's like, I thought it would be so fulfilling. And it's like, it's not, mm. you know? I mean, some people would say, wow, you went to Oxford and Harvard Business School. Okay, yeah. Does it make me feel any better than any other person? I guess I'm proud in a way, but not really. Mm. I still made lots of dumb mistakes. Okay, doesn't make me better than anybody else. The more you know, it's just okay. Great, I achieved that. Well, okay, but life's more than just putting your whole sense of self-esteem and records or achievements, and right. that that is a pretty certain way to uh, economic. Let, uh, I mean, emotional letdown, I should say. Well, it makes a lot of sense, especially what you're saying about it doesn't have to be an and or an, an, a zero sum game. It can be an and or and your purpose can transcend you know your business but also be influential in your business how what, like, what what are some questions people listening to this could ask themselves or others to determine what makes them unique and what could identify what their purpose is yeah i mean the first thing is starts with how am i wired you know whether it's um interests skills you know artistic mathematical the, you know, you, you got to live in light of your design because if you don't do that, again, that's just stupid. You know, if you're artistic, I know this sounds pretty obvious, but a lot of people don't do this, then explore your artistic self, whatever that is. You know, if you want to achieve something, it's going to be tough. Any major goal is going to have setbacks. You better make sure you're passionate about it. And how do you become, how do you make sure you're passionate about it? If it's, if it's linked to, you know, fundamental, beliefs, whether it's um, in a business or if it's a nonprofit, if you feel like, look, I, I can't stand the fact that there's um, a very low level of uh, internet access, you know, uh, how do I provide tablets to, you know, people in third world, it's got to be a way, something you feel like, you know, this matters, I feel like it's my mission because I believe in it, I'm sick of seeing uh, what doesn't need to be. You know, well, those are tied to some fundamental beliefs and values. So when you link wiring with values, which inevitably means you're passionate about it, you'll have a vision that, you know, you just can't, you get excited to get up in the morning. 
surround yourself with what we call fellow travelers, people who buy into that vision, mm. you know, because more and more, and I, you know, obviously know this and your listeners do, you know, you want to hire people that believe in the vision of your company. People don't want more than a paycheck. If you're a young person, millennial, you want to believe in the cause of the place you're working for. Right. And so that's another good reason to make sure you believe in what you're doing. Because if you don't, others won't. So surround yourself with a team of complementary skills that really um, want to help you achieve that vision, uh, our vision, their vision, all of our visions in your organization. But yeah, it starts with the internal before it goes uh, external. So there are some steps that requires choices and it requires some self-examination. Maybe you've been on the wrong track for 20, 30 years. Okay, it's never too late, you know? You don't have to change overnight. And again, when you talk a lot about baby steps, what's one small step this week that I can make? Maybe it's journaling, talking to a friend. Hey, what do you think I'm really interested in? Because mm. people who've known us for decades, they know who we are. Mm. They may not tell us, but if we ask them, all of our friends and family will say, well, this is who Warwick is. This is who Kevin is. It's not a secret, right? They know. Well, you know, maybe they're all wrong about who we are. They could be, but maybe they're not, so... Am I really living in light of who I am and what I want to be, or am I trying to meet somebody else's expectations? So, uh, yeah, any of that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. And, and for people listening to this, if they're still listening to this, which they are, <laughs> forty-two minutes in, you know, they're going to want to see results. They're going to want to have an idea of how they can transform their lives. From your clients that you've worked with, what are some of the results or people that stick out to you that have followed this framework? And are now living a, a meaningful life. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I think of certainly the people that we have, um, you know, it's not so much just listening to me, but it, because what I'm saying, I wouldn't say is something that's never been said before. But when I look at the people that we've we've interviewed, maybe over 50 people on, on the podcast, Beyond the Crucible, the, you know, we've had everybody, as I said, from a Navy SEAL uh, who's paralyzed, um, and a training accident. How did he overcome that? He went to a clinic actually in San Diego, funnily enough, it's where he lives. Yeah. And there's a, there's a great vet clinic because that's, I know you mentioned earlier, that's where, where you are. And um, I forget the name of it, but there's this clinic that has as good a machinery for vets as exists in the country, better than your average VA hospital. Nothing wrong with that. And it gives vets maximum ability of movement. Well, at least the executive director there. He feels pumped about what he does, right. obviously. Yeah. You know, another, somebody else in California, uh, north of where you are in Los Angeles, uh, a woman, Michelle Quay, who uh, was hit by a, a car in Taiwan, where she grew up in, at age eight. And it really uh, altered her mobility for the rest of her life. She never grew beyond that. She's still a little over four foot. She has crutches. Well, for years, it was hard to overcome that. But eventually, she said, look, I know I may I maybe want to be normal. I won't be able to go to parties and have boyfriends and all this negative self-talk, rightly or wrong, she put in herself. But she changed her attitude. Now she's one of the most joyful people I know. She mm -hmm. climbed Machu Picchu in, in Peru, which is pretty tough when you've got, you know, really high stairs and you've got crutches. She had to crawl on her hands and knees to get up. it. But she did with people cheering at the top like a tour group. She didn't even know. Um, so, so many stories of people that have been through tragedy, but they've refused to be a victim. And so it's this mindset shift. It's, you know, using their pain for a purpose. Life's not over, focused on other people. Story after story of people that have been through really hard circumstances, but um, they refuse to just sit down and under the covers, if you will, for the rest of their life. They've, they've refused to just stay a victim, even victims of abuse. I mean, we've had a number of those Um it's really a mindset shift. It's, you know, I'm just so uplifted when I hear stories of people that I didn't know until they're on the podcast or I met them. So it's, mm. it's not so much just about how my methodology can help people, which I like to think it can, but it's really, you know, it's what people who bounce back do, you know, these, some of these principles, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, COVID's been a big macro experiment of who's going to show up, especially during a great time. Who are those 
protagonists, who are the people that can rise like a phoenix out of the ashes during this year. But the question is this, is do you have to go through a severe trial in order to live a life of significance? That is a great question. I'd like to say, I hope you don't have to. Um, the, the answer is sort of yes and no, you shouldn't have to, but for most people, unless they get hit with, with the two before, they tend not to think. Maybe there's a few enlightened souls who maybe it's through their parents or through their friends. They just have a, um, a mindset that they don't fall into these patterns and they want to live a life that's significant, focused on others. They, they want to um, live in light of their design and their wiring, their passions and their beliefs. And it's possible, but um, gosh, sometimes we do need a, a bit of a, not need, but sometimes it takes a crisis or a challenge to make us refocus. Mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be nice if we didn't need it, but because we're human and we tend to go on autopilot or live other people's expectations, it's, you know, I don't know, sort of like asking, you know, can't everybody be a great leader? Can't, can't everybody lead like Abraham Lincoln, right? With, you know, uh, malice towards none, charity towards all. Can't we all be Abraham Lincoln? The answer is yes, but it requires choices. You know, it requires immense inner character, you know, mm. and it, it's just, I don't know. I don't know that it's so much a wiring thing. It's just not all of it. I mean, how many of us, uh, you know, you think of whoever it is, whether it's Nelson Mandela or Gandhi or Lincoln, you, whoever your favorite hero is, do we, we will have that capacity, but it requires some pretty significant choices in life. And for many, it typically requires some kind of crucible, some sort of pivotal moment to change our thinking. So it shouldn't be necessary, but I, sadly, it seemed like it often is, would be the short way of answering that. Very good question. What about people who are maybe trying to bite off more than they can chew? Uh, when you hear someone that comes to you that's really struggling and you kind of know, oh, I don't know, are they going to be able to get past this fear? Are they going to be able to sustain this momentum? Have you ever told someone, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't try to reach, you know, the, your potential or reach this ultimate vision that you have? Or do you think that's bad advice? Boy. Interesting. I'd say visions grow. So I didn't have this whole vision of crucible leadership, like, you know, book coming out in October and podcast and blog, social media. And, you know, when I gave that talk in church in 2008, it's just, I want to write my story and somehow use that to help people. That was all mm -hmm. it was. You think of, in the book, I talk about Walt Disney, who obviously everybody knows. He didn't have this big vision of Disney World and movies. You know, back in the 20s when he started doing Mickey Mouse and these animated shorts, it's like, you know, these animated shorts, they could be better. They could tell better stories. They could be more interesting. And then from there, okay, maybe, you know, why don't we do a feature-length color movie? Mm -hmm. I think it was like 38, 39 and Snow White. Back when people were like, oh, no, you're going to watch a color movie and that long it's not going to catch the people so the vision grew step by step uh, you know this you know disneyland that grew in a time when amusement parks were dangerous places lots of alcohol drunkenness it wasn't a family place and so you can have an amusement park for kids you're nuts that doesn't exist as a model it makes no sense all the experts in the industry said this is certain to fail so i guess the point of all those stories is f focus less on the big vision. I, honestly, I don't have a 10 year vision. Maybe I should. Mm. I'm a strategic planner by nature. I'm very strategic. I'm very analytical because I, I wouldn't, and this is just for me. Okay. Cause I'm a, I'm about as fearful a person as I know. I'm, you know, I'm because I reflect and I think of all the things that could go wrong. And so I don't move very quickly. I'm very reflective. So there's all these things that I'm not Mr. Typical Visionary, you know, the fearless visionary. So I'm very cautious. But so if I start thinking about a 10-year vision, I'll do nothing. I'll stay under the covers. But okay, what's one step I can do today, you know? And it may be a challenging step. Like, I don't know, a year and a half ago, somebody said, well, maybe you do a podcast. Like, well, 
I love asking questions. I'm curious. It's a bit of a leap for me, but okay, let me let me explore it. I'm not saying yes, but let me just think about it. Let me get some counsel and over a few months, okay, let, let me try it. What's the worst that can happen? You know? So think less about the big grand vision, but just try to be true to what do you feel called, whether it's spiritually or whatever. What do I feel called today, this week, this month? What's one positive step in the right direction that you know builds on my skills? Is something that I'm passionate about, and let's go from there. It may it may not be founding the next, you know, um, worldwide charity. Maybe it's just doing something in your neighborhood to clean mm-hmm. up your neighborhood to make it safe for kids to play, or maybe it'll grow into a worldwide phenomenon. But and the other thing I think really to your point is the size of the vision is not so much relevant. If it's having a big impact to you and your neighborhood, that's a big vision to me. So quit trying to say, oh, well, I do good in my neighborhood, but gee, this other person started this thing that's doing good in 50 neighborhoods. And I'm not, well, it's not a competition, right? Mm. So quit worrying about what it could be. Quit worrying about the competition. Just what can I do today, this week? And then that's freeing because one step at a time, it may grow and may morph or it may not. And it's all good. So long as you're helping others and living true to who you are, you've already won. Mm. You know, so yeah, the whole big vision thing, I'm not against vision and planning, but in terms of our own personal life, to have a vision for your life, and I'm not saying it's wrong, it just it doesn't work for me, put it that way, because I, I right. wouldn't do anything. I'd be I'm too, too fearful. <laughs> well, it's such stoic advice, you know, it, it, when we go back to expectations, right? It's like that might have the expectation to become this, Right. And then everything you try to do goes toward that. But I think what you're saying is, you know, you got to start with like the intention, you know, what is, you know, who, what makes you unique? What is your North star? And if, you know, you're, you're a boat and you take a little turn, eventually, right. you know, you're going to try to achieve this big grand vision. You're going to be over here and it's going to take a long time right. until you get back. And it's, it's just such great advice starting small. Well, and and, and it's, it's freeing. It's like, what can I do yeah. today? What can I do this week? And um, who do I need to talk to? Who do I need on my team? You know, what's the next step? Um, so long as you feel like you're moving in a positive direction, that you feel like has promise, good things happen when you're moving in, in positive directions. I mean, over time, we've grown our team at Crucible Leadership and opportunities have come. It's amazing how generous people are. Like a buddy of mine said, I know somebody, uh, you know, Morgan James that might want to publish your book. And it's like, okay, it's like, if you keep moving, it's amazing how nice people can be. Mm. And out of the blue, offer you something, not because it's going to help them, just because. And so you just take that small step at a time and you'll be amazed where you get to. And you'll be amazed at how many people want to help you with your dream. Because mm. they see you light up, you see it's helping people, and they just come out of the woodwork. It's just... It's a weird thing. There's a lot of bad people, but there's a lot of good people in the world that really want to help, you know? Has the definition of growth changed for you? Because, you know, we think about failure and, and you know, severe trials and overcoming, and you, you kind of take a few dips, but at the same time you're growing. Does the definition, like, how, do, how would you define growth, I guess? Interesting. You know, because I grew up with about as much money, power, and prestige as you can have, Money has never been a motivator for me. It never was, never has been, it's not now. So I don't think in terms of, oh, how big can Crucible Leadership be or how many books can I sell, which is probably a bad thing to say if publishers are listening. But, you know, yeah, I want it to be sold to help people, but not because of the money. I mean, I, I care about quality product. If I'm going to do something, it's either 100% or it's nothing. It's, I care about that. But it's, to me, growth is more... Um, you know, am I growing growing as a human being? Am I growing in terms of my skills? Like, you know, are the things that I'm doing that are outside of my comfort zone, but will help what I believe is important that I need to be doing? You know, like podcast was a good example. Um, so, you know, be focus. Don't worry so much. Like, if if you ask a CEO and they say, "What's your vision?" Well, to you know, grow revenues twenty percent for the next five years. That is always the wrong answer. Right. And yeah. any good CEO you talk to will say that is the wrong answer. 
you know, and you typically won't succeed because growth hap growth and revenue happens as a byproduct of a compelling vision. You know, Southwest Airlines, their vision was to make travel affordable to unite families. That's their mission and vision. It animates all their employees. Are they successful financially? Incredibly so. But so for growth shouldn't be about numbers. It should be about you know, what's the next step for me? How do I grow as a person is the most important thing, but it's more just, yeah, think of growth differently. It's more as a human being. And if your business grows, it's not so much for numbers, it's more growing to help more people. If you're Walt Disney to entertain more people too, it's, it's measuring growth in a different way, more character, more human centered, more yeah, it's not about numbers. Numbers are a byproduct, you know? And Absolutely. Yeah, go for it. No, I was going to say, most people, like even successful athletes, you ask them about whether it's Roger Federer, Tom Brady, it's like they, they want to win, they want to succeed, but they're focused on how can I be the best today in this game? I will have to train, I have to eat the right food. So long as I've done my best, I'm not going to like it if I lose, but I can accept it. And if they're focused on the process, the day-to-day -day practices, the, how can I get 1% better? It's really they're not fixated on results and why are they successful? I would argue because they're not fixated on results. It's a byproduct of obsessive training, obsessive uh, desire to get better, to improve. Those are typically the ones that achieve great things. who are focused on incremental growth and not about numbers, but just about being the best person, people they can be. Right, right. Like, are you better today than you were yesterday? Incremental, 1%. Exactly. And are you better at the things that you feel matter to you based on your own personal values and beliefs, what they are, uh, depending mm. on what they are? So long as you can say, yes, I feel like I'm being true to myself and I feel like I am being, you know, growing and improving as a person, as a business in the ways that matter, then, then you can sleep well at night mm. and the results will take care of themselves. If you do that, you know, all things being equal. Mm. Warwick, it's been a pleasure learning from you today, uh, my friend, let's bring this home. What is your definition of a real leader? Uh, boy, a real leader is somebody that, um, knows who they are. They are folk. They, they know, they know, they're true to their own values and their design, and they want to make an impact in the world, not for themselves, but for other people. They're other focused. That's to me what a real leader is. And I think, and real leaders, and I, I know you've had a lot of them on your podcast and the magazine, they know that. They know that that's what a real leader means. And the, the thing that's affirming about what you do in your organization is, you're holding up leaders that they're making a difference. They are real in, in, in the real sense of that word. I love it. Well, well said uh, for Warwick Fairfax. I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, make a difference in others' lives. And always, folks, keep it real. Thanks, work.